Buongiorno a tutti, farò un breve saluto prima in italiano eh, e poi passeremo all'inglese che sarà la lingua utilizzata oggi eh, sia da noi che dal dottor Garriba, il nostro ospite della Commissione Europea e, e poi le conclusioni saranno date dal nostro lettore che è in viaggio da Roma. Quindi, uh, thanks for everyone for coming today. Uh, to celebrate the, the starting of the new academic year, 2022-2023, is very important for us because this year is the third year we celebrate uh, the year when uh, we were born uh, in 2012. And uh, Stefano Rossi, Professor Stefano Rossi, that is our Dean of the School of Engineering and Design, uh, will remind us uh, all the steps uh, Uh, done uh, from the beginning uh, to today and towards uh, the next years. Uh, when we have some surprise for you, but uh, we learn uh, during uh, today and uh, the next weeks, months, and years. Uh, for me, it's very pleasure to have today Dr. Massimo Gariba uh, present for giving us a lecture on the making the UN carbon neutral reality or dream. Today, energy is the most important uh, issue, is a critical issue uh, due, uh, especially uh, for the war in Ukraine, but the, the, the energetic transition is already started and now it's accelerated. Uh, What are the other forms of energy for the next years? We can uh, looking for instead of carbon or oil. We know, we try to learn today something. And uh, energy is also important for us because as you know, energy is part of our research at uh, our school of engineering is part of uh, our courses from this year, as Stefan would say, we have a specific course uh, in the uh, Mechanical Engineer Forum dedicated to the, to the energy. And uh, before giving the possibility to Dr. Gariba, is uh, the Deputy Director uh, of the direct Directorate for Energy, and with the coordination of the Eratum policy. I hope that everyone studied during this high secondary school that Eratum coming before the UN. And um, please, Stefano. Okay, just uh, two words in Italian. So Grazie a tutti per, per essere qui, anche agli studenti del primo anno che ci sono, magari avranno qualche difficoltà maggiore, ma non vi preoccupate perché diciamo, eh, l'inglese è importante, quindi vi abituate adesso e poi vi aspetta la magistrale in inglese che è un nostro, eh, diciamo, eh, quello che abbiamo ottenuto l'altro anno ed è una grossa opportunità per voi. Ok, so, uh, thank you for staying here. It's, uh, Pleasure for me to open the new academic year, the 22-23 academic year. As Giuseppe said before, uh, this year uh, we celebrate the 10th birthday of our courses, and we all we started in 2012 the first uh, bachelor degree in industrial engineering, and uh, we uh, grew up very fast. We opened in the 2015 the first uh, master's degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, after two years, also the PhD course in uh, engineering for environment and for energy and environment. And uh, nowadays, we can offer to our students all the steps of the Italian academic uh, uh, education. 
So it's a very great opportunity for, for you, for your for, for the students. Uh, but if we decided uh, two years ago also to open a new bachelor degree, as you know, in design, and in order to see the, the industrial products in two different uh, uh, way, in two different point of view. So for the, from the uh, engineering point of view and also for the designer point of view. And after that, uh, last year, we decided to, to have two main change. The first one, we open a new curriculum uh, in the bachelor degree, in the industrial engineering bachelor degree for the uh, aeronautic staff. And it is focused on the uh, aircraft maintenance. And the last change, but is, is the, the last but not the least, is the change of the language of the mechanical engineering course. So we pass from Ita Italian language to the English. It is a very important uh, uh, change because we decided to open our course to the world. And so also we can see in this, in this room uh, today, we have a lot of students from the, the other part of the world, from the Germany, the Ethiopia, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, Egypt and other, and other nation, other states. And uh, in this way, we can offer to you a very uh, exciting atmosphere and a mix of culture that for me, it would be uh, the, best, the best things that we can offer to you and to, uh, for your uh, education. So I hope that uh, also for the students at the first year, should be a great opportunity, and don't worry also for the for the students at the third year. So don't worry if you decide to change the language, because uh, you can study in English, but the the professor can help you also in Italian if you have, have some some problem during during the class. So it's a very pleasure for me to stay to stay here. And uh, it's important this this uh, speech uh, because we decided, as, as also as also uh, Giuseppe told you, we decided uh, to uh, have two different uh, um, uh, curricula in the mechanical uh, engineering course. One of them is on the future energy. So this is the reason because we decided to have this speak. So now uh, I want to to introduce the, our guest, special guest, uh, Massimo Gariba for the, the speech, making the EU carbon neutral reality or three. So, thank you. Massimo Gariba present this lecture. I would like to thank uh, Annie that today is present um, uh, for this uh, celebration, and also uh, Luca Tosto and Massimiliano Toccarelli. You know that uh, Walter Tosto is the most important uh, industry working on JT6 Emitter. Our, our, our school of engineering is strongly present in uh, Euratom and uh, also in um, collaboration with the private companies. And uh, Walter Tosto is the one of the most important in this sector, at least on the engineering technology part. So, thank you very much. Yes. So, good morning to everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm a little bit intimidated, you know, I've been working in energy and nuclear energy for the past 35 years. Uh, but uh, speaking to younger people always uh, is uh, uh, the biggest challenge that uh, that uh, that you can have. So let me let me try um, let me try and uh, and uh, show you a little bit the structure of what, uh, of what I want uh, what I want to tell you. Uh, first of all, um, the challenges that we have ahead. Ah. Okay, forse, forse più facile, grazie. Um, the challenges that, that we see ahead, um, what we have been doing so far, and what there is, what there is uh, a little bit farther away uh, than, 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 we are, than we are looking at present. 
So let's start, let's start with what, what the situation is. Well, the situation is that we are still growing as population worldwide. And this implies that we are uh, putting um, more and more strain on the, on the global resources. And this creates uh, a situation of competition and a situation uh, competition which is uh, which can be technological uh, but it is a competition that uh, goes into into more and more the the resources so um, the, the second thing that i think is uh, absolutely important to, to keep in mind is that we are uh, consistently emitting more and more co2 um, more and more CO2, we are heating this planet, we are changing the way that these, uh, uh, that these planets work, and we at the EU have been uh, uh, pushing for uh, uh, decreasing these, uh, uh, these paths of emission and trying to keep the climate within the boundaries that, uh, uh, that we know today. Unfortunately, if you look at this slide, uh, we count less and less. Uh, we are only 8% of the global emission uh, from, uh, from the EU. So uh, whatever, efforts, whatever efforts we do, um, we can lead the pack, we can uh, benefit from um, moving uh, technologically and industrially ahead than others, but uh, effectively, our influence on the global warming is limited, um, and the evidence and the evidence is there. I mean, uh, I think it's useless that I mention that I mention the fact that we have more and more frequency of extreme events uh, at all latitudes. Um, for those of you who go skiing last year, I think in this country there was very little snow. So uh, it is it is uh, um, it is more and more more and more evident that the um, effect of human beings is uh, creating uh, situations which are uh, which are difficult to manage. Uh, but there are also some good news. If you look if you look at this graph, you will see that. Uh, we have been able to uh, decrease the overall amount of uh, CO2 that we emit in the, in the EU27 uh, in the past uh, 30 years. And why is this important? Because in the meantime, the GDP has grown between two and two and a half times. So uh, let me say before uh, the 80s, there was a, a linear link between economic growth, so GDP growth, and uh, emissions. Uh, so uh, this slide shows that it is actually possible to break this link and keep growing while uh, decreasing the, um, the global emissions. Nevertheless, um, if you look at the picture a little bit more globally, uh, you will see that the situation is, on the contrary, not so good. Because uh, if you look at the two sources that do not produce CO2, which is uh, uh, nuclear and renewables, uh, they have been basically constant in the energy mix in the past uh, 20 years. So they, uh, they hover around, let me say, 20%. Uh, and the rest is uh, solidly, um, integrated into the um, uh, hydrocarbon um, industry. So this is, where, uh, this is where the whole problem is. So despite all the efforts, despite of all the scenarios, despite all the policy push, when you go and look at the reality, uh, this, is, this is what you see. And uh, well, there was a blip uh, during the pandemic in 2020, but as you as you uh, know, uh, as soon as the economy is reopened, the situation has gone back, let me say, to uh, business as usual. 
So this means that if you want to reach the net zero by 2050, the time that you have is uh, uh, reducing day by day. If I remember correctly, somebody told me that there are a little bit more than 50,000 days until, uh, until 2050. Um, so each, each day actually uh, starts to count. So when you look also at the technologies that we use uh, these days, um, you, will see, you will see that um, we have uh, clearly one, which is, uh, which is of scale, which is coal. And this is where the pledges for uh, eliminated coal, you know, are coming uh, from everywhere. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what happens in reality is that the use of coal is very solidly anchored in uh, the global economy, but also in the EU. And I will make a comment in, uh, in a while on that. Then you can see that um, all um, uh, renewable energies and uh, nuclear power uh, go significantly lower than that. And then you have a, a so-called transition technology, which is gas, uh, which of course is much more beneficial than coal. And this is what uh, in, the, in the EU uh, we have uh, somehow chosen to anchor the uh, transition in the 2030s and 2040s. So uh, this was all going, let me say, uh, I wouldn't say fine, but this was all going following its own trajectory. Uh, unless uh, and until uh, the 24th of February um, stroke. So all 24th of February is the day that uh, Russia invaded the Ukraine. Um, gas prices exploded and the Russians uh, started to weaponize the use of gas. So gas has become a tool to um, force the end of the European solidarity uh, towards the Ukraine. It has not worked. It has not worked so far, let me say like that. Uh, but it is clearly something that has played, that has played a role. So uh, if oil went to $120 a barrel in, within a couple of weeks, now it's down, today was, uh, was 74. Um, but gas went to a price which is the equivalent of $500 a barrel. So instead of paying for your petrol, I saw it was 156 here with the government subsidies, I suppose, and so on. Uh, this means that you should pay still three and a half times more. So you should have one liter of, uh, of petrol around five, uh, five euros uh, to, compare, to compare with the, with the, with the prices of the gas as they came up and then, and then came down. Now, in Europe, we had, we had uh, to invent a response. And you have to understand that uh, the situation is, uh, is very complicated because of two reasons. First is that the energy market of each uh, EU member state is different. The energy mix is different. And so the, the, the starting position of each of the member states is different. Secondly, uh, by treaty, by EU treaty, the um, energy mix of each member state is determined by that member state. Um, but at the same time, we want to have a coherent energy policy, so where there are interconnections and, and exchanges, and we want to have a coherent climate policy, as I tried to, as, as I tried to mention before. So, you see that there are inherent in the system, uh, built in some contradictions that, uh, that, we have, that we have to look at. Now, I will not go, of course, in the details of, of everything that, I've, that, that we have done, but there are, I think there are two important things to retain. One is that uh, there has been a uh, very strong accent on uh, something that some people don't like to hear, which is called energy efficiency. That's the best energy, the one that you don't need to produce and you don't need to use. So uh, we put a little bit more pullovers on, 
and uh, uh, we lower the heating. Um, maybe some of us drove a little bit less and so on. The second thing, we uh, tried in all possible ways to uh, fill up the uh, gas storage that we have in Europe, because so much of the uh, both the electricity demand, but also the heating demands and the industrial demands relies on storage. So we set ourselves a target of 80%. And in fact, our storages are filled at around 95% today. So we have exceeded our target. We were blessed with a uh, autumn that was not as cold as other ones. And so, so far we have been navigating the situation. We have to see what the situation will be in uh, 2023 when we expect that there will be basically no Russian flows uh, to fill our, um, our reservoirs. So the only flow that is coming at the moment is the one, funnily enough, the transit through the Ukraine, but there have been announcements by Gazprom to uh, wanting to stop them. So there is a frenzy to um, uh, access as much as possible all other uh, sources of uh, liquefied natural gas uh, from African countries, uh, from the US, uh, from uh, wherever you can get it, knowing that, first of all, uh, liquefied natural gas is more expensive. And secondly, uh, that there is a huge competition with places like Korea and Japan which are the, uh, how can I say, primary, being traditionally the primary recipients of such fuels in, um, in the world. So um, the European Green Deal and so on, I mean, uh, just to remind you uh, that as a response to the challenges that I tried to mention in the, in the very first part of the, um, of the introduction, uh, and before, you know, all this mess with, uh, with Russia uh, started, uh, we had uh, a very clear path to uh, reducing greenhouse gas, gas emission 55% by 2030 and zero by uh, 2050. This has two implications. The first implication is, uh, of course, the climate implication. And the second implication is uh, energy security because the, um, uh, the production of uh, electricity and energy in general uh, through renewable sources is an indigenous production. So once you have installed your windmills, once you have installed your solar panels, you have, you have uh, decoupled from the um, uh, from whatever happens with the gas, from whatever happens with the oil price and so on. So you have, you have these two elements that play, that play in, uh, in sync. Therefore, after the uh, events of February, uh, it has been very clear that, uh, because the question was, should we slow down the transition? Do we enter an emergency situation in which we slow down the transition? Well, the answer is no. On the contrary, we need to accelerate the transition because we want to get rid uh, as soon as possible of uh, any uh, dependency. So targets have been, targets have been uh, improved and so on. So this is, uh, this is, where, uh, this is where we are. So this is um, the response. And as I said, this is where we try to uh, accelerate and uh, and give uh, uh, can I say uh, substance to the fact that we need to become completely uh, independent from uh, imports from our eastern neighbor. <laughs> so uh, let me let me now switch to my um, home subject. Uh, because as I told you, I've been working in energy for 35 years, and uh, most of these has been uh, has been devoted to uh, to nuclear to nuclear energy. So why why am I saying this? Because um, you know, nuclear energy is a uh, I, I like to call it a religious subject. There are those who believe in it, there are those who don't believe in it. 
uh, I'm not a believer, so I I am I stay on neither camp. I just want I just want to I just want to warn you. Um, in the past uh, few years in Europe, the subject has been mostly dodged by uh, by many people, and I think that it is a subject which inevitably uh, has to come back and has to come back for two reasons. One is that uh, there are many people who believe that you cannot have an electrical system without a base load. And if you want a clean base load, uh, well, this is what you need somehow. And secondly, uh, because uh, you know, gas is uh, very volatile and you, know, you close the tap and it stops. Uh, you don't cook your pasta any longer. And um, if you have nuclear fuel, uh, well, you have normally 18 months for a load. And if you have another loads in reserve, you can survive 36 months. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, different. So these two ladies, one is the president of the commission and the other one is the commissioner for energy, uh, have been also uh, you know, mentioning, uh, don't forget that this source exists. And when you look at the situation, at the situation in Europe, um, the situation in Europe is that we have basically half of the member states that rely on, on nuclear energy. And those who rely on nuclear energy rely heavily on, on nuclear energy. Uh, often, you know, especially think in this country, people think about France. But if you look at the Nordic countries, Sweden and Finland, and all the countries in the let me say eastern border of the EU, uh, the reliance on nuclear energy is very high. It goes from 50 to 70 percent in basically in basically all the countries. Now we have deleted the UK from the map um, after after 2016, but uh, also the UK is a uh, uh, let me say heavy user of uh, nuclear energy. Now. The, um, the uh, situation in Europe is that, as I said, we have many school of thoughts. We have uh, those ones who are getting out, you know, Germany, first of all. Uh, they were supposed to close the last three reactors at the end of this year. They're not doing that. They have prolonged the three reactors uh, uh, until, until the end of April. Belgium wanted to substitute, uh, Belgium is another heavily uh, uh, another country that heavily relies on, on the use of nuclear energy. Uh, Belgium has decided to prolong by 10 years the life of uh, the operation of, of a number of reactors. Uh, they wanted to substitute everything with gas to do the transition. You can imagine that after the events in, in February, uh, they, had, they had to change mind. And of course, there is France. France has taken a very lukewarm position towards nuclear for the past six to eight years, I would say, um, only to change uh, completely its stance in, um, in the recent past with the program of President Macron, which uh, wants to build six large EPR reactors, uh, say, immediately, followed by another eight in, uh, in a second stage. And then there are new entrants like uh, Poland that has a large nuclear program of uh, six to nine uh, gigawatt by uh, 2040. Um, uh, this is light of the dream, as I like, uh, as I usually like to, to, to call it, because uh, uh, one thing you have to keep in mind in nuclear energy is that uh, people talk a lot about projects that they will do. Uh, and then whether they will do it or not is a different matter. Um, I, can, I can tell you that, uh, that, uh, that in the EU, uh, I will not make names or, or anything, I don't want to upset or offend anyone, but uh, there have been lots of, lots of projects that uh, have not, uh, have simply have not seen the light. Now in Finland, um, the old Pilwoto 3 EPR, which should have been ready in 2009, is in the phase of starting. And it's extremely important because, the, um, because Finland used to import 15% of its electricity from, uh, from Russia. 
and with the um, start of operation of Volcano Auto 3 will be completely independent. Uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, when uh, now Volcano Auto 3 is in a commissioning phase, so it's working on and off. So when it's not working, the electricity price in the past months was averaging 220, 250 um, euro per uh, megawatt hour. And when all kilo auto works, it goes down to 60. So you, you can see that there is a, a cause effector of four that actually influences um, the situation. Now, we have another problem that I would like to, uh, to briefly mention, which is the fact that Next to uh, the, uh, this is not a gas crisis. This is a deliberate uh, stop of imports and exports from from a third country. So next to the to the gas situation, let me call it. Uh, we have another situation, which is the fact that in France we have uh, a number of reactors which have been stopped. A large number of reactors which have been stopped. There are fifty six in France and up to 28 have been stopped because of uh, corrosion issues in the, in the primary cooling circuits. And unfortunately, uh, this has coincided exactly with, uh, with this with these, uh, problem. And therefore, you know, the restart of these, uh, of these reactors is one of the priorities that um, that the French have uh, at the moment. Now, what do we do from the European Commission for nuclear? So first of all, um, in 1957 in Rome, the Euratom Treaty was signed, entered into force the, the, the year after. It was signed by the six founding members of the uh, Euratom and the, uh, the European Economic Community those days. Um, and if you remember, maybe some of you remember, there used to be three treaties, one which was on coal and steel, the second one on nuclear energy, and the third one which was about uh, uh, the economic community. So two treaties out of three at the beginning of, the, of the, uh, what then became the EU were uh, energy-based. And this was because the economies were coming out of the war, the Second World War. And energy, of course, is an absolutely fundamental instrument for growth and uh, development of, um, of life. So uh, since we have, as I try to explain, such a divided situation among our member states, uh, from the European Commission, uh, we do not favor or uh, hamper the use of nuclear energy. Our job is very simple, is to well, very simple, very complicated, uh, but it is to uh, create the conditions for those who want to use nuclear energy to do so under the highest safety, security standards that exist nowadays. And so we have painfully put in place legislation. I say painfully because the first attempts started in 2002 and only in 2009 we had the uh, first nuclear safety directive, which was then completely reshaped in uh, 2014, following Fukushima. Uh, we have also another law, a directive is a law that has to be uh, put in place then by all the member states on the handling of uh, waste. And the third one, which instead existed uh, traditionally, uh, which is a directive that is aimed at the protection of uh, workers and the general public against uh, radiation. This is a directive that involves everything, let me say, from the medical field uh, to the radon that you might have in your cellar uh, to uh, how workers in the nuclear installations have, have to be protected. So, um, Waste. I, I, mean, I want to stay on waste because waste is uh, uh, one of those issues that seem to be um, in the mind of many people as being uh, one of the reasons why nuclear energy shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be used. Uh, what, is quite, what is quite interesting to see is that 90% um, of nuclear waste which is produced uh, is actually uh, perfectly handled uh, at, all, at all levels. Uh, 
Also, the other 10% is perfectly handled. Uh, it's handled in the sense that it's managed, but it is not, uh, uh, but it is not disposable, has not been disposed of. So this is changed. Um, we have, uh, in Europe, we have three, three member states, Finland, Sweden, and France, which are uh, worldwide leaders in the, in the management of, of high-level waste. And the first uh, uh, deep geological repository uh, will enter in operation in Finland in 2025. And I believe it will be a game changer because it will demonstrate that uh, it is possible to uh, safely store um, um, highly radioactive waste, waste in, in a safe way. Here you can see the um, studies that, uh, that are in place in all the different member states that um, look at uh, the geological repositories. Uh, not Italy. Eh? Italy. Italy is a, is a long-standing nuclear country. Was one of the was one of the uh, most advanced nuclear countries uh, forever. Uh, but even the intermediate waste repository uh, that I think should have been 2016, if my memory doesn't fail me, is not yet uh, is not yet uh, there. One of the key elements for being able to work with radioactive waste and with nuclear installation is transparency, information of the public, and saying things as they are in terms of risk and in terms of what can happen or not happen and under what circumstances. This has obviously been an openness policy which has been followed by the, by the, um, by the northern countries, Sweden, Sweden and Finland in, in particular. And we believe that this is one, this is one of the reasons uh, why they are so much ahead of the others. So uh, then there is the fashion. And the fashion these days is called uh, small modular reactors. Um, why? Because uh, especially in Europe, whereas in the world, you know, there is, in, especially China and India, there is lots of constructions of nuclear power plants. In Europe, uh, as I said, there are there are four which are under construction. There is uh, there is Olki Water in Finland, as I said. There is Flamanville in France, and there is Mohovce three and four in in Slovakia. But the problem is that they are all late and overcost. Late by many years, tens of years, and overcost by several billion. So it is obviously an economic model which does not work and that all does not work in Europe. It's loss of competence, uh, loss of industrial capacity. So for many years, nothing has been built. So now, now, now it is difficult to do. So the, the, the fashion is small modular reactors because uh, you can basically build them in a factory and then uh, put them on a site. Uh, and instead of costing, uh, you know, 5 billion euros, they are supposed to cost uh, 500 million. So uh, in financing terms, this is, of course, a complete, a complete game changer. Don't forget that the cost of a nuclear power plant is 90% construction cost. Maintenance and fuel is only 10% of the overall life of a nuclear power plant, which spans over 100 years, basically. This is the order of magnitude that you have. If you compare it with gas, which is what we have been talking so far, it's exactly the other way around. In a gas-fired power plant, 90% of the cost is the gas itself. So if you don't use it, it doesn't cost you. Um, yeah, uh, the, the, we are working on trying to on trying make people realize that, uh, um, again, this is a technology that can be deployed. There are lots of medium-sized coal power plants, around three, 400 megawatts, that could be usefully substituted by small modular reactors, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. And of course, this would help dramatically the, um, uh, the race towards decarbonization. Now, uh, there is a little bit of a problem, which is the one of the chicken and the egg. I don't want to build the first, I just want to build the second one. So you have to build the first, so that I can learn from you how uh, this should be done. And uh, as long as the chicken and the egg is not broken, um, uh, trust me, 
it will be it will be difficult to see uh, anything of these uh, of these uh, sort of deploy. They are interesting machines. Uh, they they are called small modular reactors, but they go from uh, you know from micro reactors of one megawatt to something like uh, uh, five hundred megawatts. And in Eastern Europe, we have the Russian design GBR four hundred and forty that operates that indeed produce four hundred and forty megawatts. So. We could already say that we have them in uh, in operation in Europe for some of these uh, some of these uh, reactor types. One problem which is very important if you want to have a serious production of any machine is that you need to be able to license it. So when you buy your car, you can drive it to Sweden. Um, these objects they are nationally licensed, and each national regulator will ask. Um, a set of papers which are different from each other. And as long as you do that, you know, in a nuclear power plant, you want to put a screw. You can buy the screw in Ornbach, in uh, Brico, I don't know what you have here in Italy to, 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 to buy your screws. Uh, the same screw in a nuclear power plant is exactly the same screw with this much of paperwork in order to be able to license it. So the screw that would cost you 20 cents cost you 100 euros just because of the pile of paperwork that it is associated. And if you don't solve this problem, these machines, they will not possibly take off or maybe they will not take off in our, in our country. So I'm coming to the um, last part of my presentation. What beyond 2050? So let me assume that one way or the other, uh, we arrive at uh, net zero in uh, 2050. So if we want to do that, we will have already to have built 100 gigawatt of new nuclear in uh, between 2035 and 2050. 100 gigawatt is the same amount of nuclear that we have now in, 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 in the EU27. So we will have to have a um, rather important uh, design and industrial capacity in order to in order to uh, to be able to do that, which has of course to be matched by uh, human resources that are associated to that. You know, if you if you speak to uh, to nuclear energy people, they are basically all my age uh, instead of being your age. So uh, this is this is obviously a uh, fundamental issue that uh, that this industry has, has has to solve. But nevertheless, um, as you as you can uh, as I try to explain, um, whereas I think I've been rather optimistic about uh, about the prospect of nuclear energy, uh, there are uh, there are fundamental issues which are linked with that, which are associated with acceptance and so on. So. Um, Obviously, uh, whereas you know what you build today will stay with you for another century, if not more, uh, it is obvious that uh, different types of energy needs to be needs to be developed. And one of those is nuclear fusion. Why is it why why is it so interesting? Because um, well, because one gram of um, uh, hydrogen of certain types. Uh, is equivalent uh, to eight tons of oil, just to give you just to give you an idea of the energetic um, potential of this. Um, let me say let me say let me say a few things about this because uh, you know fusion is what powers the universe in any case. So it is uh, it is a rather well. Uh, well, in a different way than magnetic confinement, of course, but it is, but it is a well, uh, a well understood reaction. Uh, there are a number of problems with, uh, with, uh, with fusion, and uh, I think it's important. It's important to uh, to to start to start saying. Well, the first problem is that what you usually hear, um, and people like to say, uh, which is that the fuel is infinitely available. Well, this is not true. Uh, the, the fuel is the deuterium and tritium. The deuterium is pretty well present in, uh, in water, in seawater. Um, tritium is not. 
tritium is uh, as a half life of uh, 12 years um, and um, and you need to produce it the only way that we produce tritium in significant quantities today is in uh, candu reactors these are canadian design reactors in the eu it is in romania that, uh, that there are uh, two in operation and two that have been under design since 2007 uh, just not to make names as i as i said before so uh, candu reactors are also in south korea in canada uh, are in india uh, and are and that indeed a source of tritium so tritium is extremely expensive um, it, it's really expensive um, it is uh, uh, very difficult it is very difficult to handle uh, because of the half-life uh, and it is and it, it has to be produced so the first thing that you need to imagine if you want to have a sustainable uh, fusion machine is that you need be you need to be able to produce uh, tritium what um, what slide says is that the blanket breeds the tritium so you have a certain object around around your plasma that when it's bombarded with, uh, with neutrons, it will uh, produce tritium. Now, this concept, um, I'm afraid, is one of those that still need to be uh, demonstrated in practice. So it is, uh, it is uh, one of the things, when I will come to it, that I will, I will, I will, I will maybe tell a little bit more, is one of those things that uh, will have to be tested in ITER and will have to become, let me say, a uh, industrial component in a uh, in a fusion machine. So the first myth that I would like to uh, remove about fusion is that uh, the fuel is infinitely available. It is reasonably there is a reasonable expectation that we can overcome the problem of fuel. Uh, however, uh, it uh, it is one of those things that need to be uh, demonstrated. Um, yeah, work on Tokamax has been going has been going on for for a long time. Um, when I read the first the first time about fusion, I was ten years old, and it was uh, nineteen seventy three. I'm going to it's the second myth of fusion, and in nineteen seventy three we were uh, thirty years away from uh, producing energy from fusion. Uh, I started working, you see the jet picture, I started working in jet in 1987 when I was, uh, when I was doing my uh, degree thesis. And in 1987, we were still 30 years away from fusion. It was 14 years later. We are in 2022 and people talk now about 50 years. So that's the second, that's the second caveat, which is very important to keep in mind. This is a extremely complex technology that um, so far has overpromised and under delivered. And so collectively, we need to change that. And we need to spin it differently if we want to be credible vis-a-vis -vis the external public. Now, one of the problems with fusion is that um, you need size, and uh, well, what we have at the moment is uh, is, is jet that sits in Callum in uh, in, uh, in the UK, and uh, there is ITER under construction. If you just look at the uh, volume of the plasma, you see that ITER is basically one order of magnitude bigger uh, bigger than jet, and um, yeah. And uh, this is the size that is needed in order to be able to uh, start having a self-sustained um, uh, reaction. So what's the setup of it? Uh, it's a little bit complicated. Let me put it uh, diplomatically. Uh, you have seven members that, uh, that work there. Um, that started, uh, the, the agreement was signed in, the, in 2006. 
And it is, uh, it is uh, for Europe, it is us, is the European Commission that uh, represents the RATO. We used to have Switzerland before, you know, we had a couple of difficulties with, uh, with, uh, between Switzerland and RATO. And because we are the host, and so our industry benefits, let me say, disproportionately from having the, the, the project cited in, uh, in Europe, we provide 45% of the of the construction costs. Um, it's a huge thing. Uh, this is the site as I've never seen it um, before, you know, uh, the construction, the construction actually uh, started. It is, it is in Cadarache, uh, near Aix-en-Provence in, uh, in the south of France. Uh, we paid already quite a bit of money. Um, Roughly, um, yeah, till 27, it will be roughly 15 billion, something like that. Um, plus the other 54%, which has been paid, which has been paid by the others. So the question is: Is it is it a loss? Is it a lot? Well, there are few uh, there are few comparisons there. So the answer is probably is not a lot. And that I think is the third problem of fusion, uh, which is the fact that the real costs of fusion have never been, um, how can I say, declared in advance, you know, saying this is a important scientific and engineering endeavor, which will cost you so many years and so much money. And I think that if one has to come clean with that, uh, if you want to have uh, continued and sustained uh, political support because the money will come will come from from the government or maybe will start to come also from industry and we can, and we can say a few words so um, look at all these look at all these uh, um, uh, question marks that there are in this schedule uh, the question marks are due to the fact that we are at the moment rebaselining the project why? Because for the third time since uh, it started in 2007, um, we are substantially late. So I'm not going, and there are important technological difficulties. So I am not going to uh, give you any dates because we are indeed discussing um, what are the actual implications of the uh, difficulties and the delays uh, that there are. Let me only say. Uh, that they are substantial, and if you look, and if you look, uh, well, if you Google it, uh, you will see certain people who, uh, contrary to me, like to make predictions. I cannot do that uh, because institutionally, uh, I chair the Inter Council these days. So I, whatever I say, would actually be a little bit more important than what than what other people uh, what other people would, would say. So. The truth is that we are uh, looking at it, and um, I think that by the middle of the end of next year, there will be a reasonable estimate of what the implication in times and costs are. Uh, I said before, it's a little bit complicated because if you look, if you look at this slide, you will see that uh, each of the partners uh, manufactures something. And, um, this is a sort of a giant 3D puzzle where uh, each and every piece will have to uh, come together. I'm not going to, you know, let me say, discuss the, the, the individual components, but I think that this gives you an idea of, uh, of how it should work. And, and you know, the, the construction is such that uh, each partner provides a certain number of components of pieces and uh, there is a central ITER team that is uh, supposed to assemble all, all the pieces once they come in uh, uh, on the site. But you know, the leap that was made from the, the previous project is, uh, is a leap which is, which is very important. And you see here a number, a number of points, complexity, scale, cost, supply chain, 
organizational integration, design maturity. Design maturity is probably one of the most interesting one, which seems to be uh, you know, something which is inherited from, uh, from nuclear energy. You start building your house without knowing exactly how it will look at the end. And then you know you look at it and say, oh, look, look at that. I mean, the sun comes from there. There is a nice wall in the meantime that you said. I'd like two windows there. And maybe why don't we also make a terrace? And um, well, that costs, I'm afraid, and delays. So that's the that's the that, that's the situation. And you can see on the on the right hand side how the um, how the money indeed has increased, you know, when it was sold for decision making, it should have costed five billion. So I don't want to comment. And, and and this is what I was trying. If you look at the scale here on the on the on the left hand side, um, the, the 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 problem is exactly what I was trying to say. It's being sold for being cheap when it is not. And it's not that you cannot do things which are not cheap. Look, look at the International Space Station. Who cares that it costed 150 billion after so, uh, over so many years? Uh, you know, the, 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 the James Webb Telescope. I mean, you look at the pictures, do you think, do you, do you really think of how much it costs? I mean, you, you, you are, you're not interested. These are scientific endeavors which are useful for society as a whole. And therefore, there is a duty of the public sector to push for these things. So I'm saying the opposite, you know, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done. It should be done. It really should be done. But it should be done knowing and declaring what is needed in order, in order to achieve it. I don't comment on this. There are 10 million parts. Uh, the 747 um, used to have 1 million parts. So we are talking about another, another order of magnitude. And then you have cutting edge technology that go all across the spectrum. You know, from the buildings, uh, which are uh, very complex nuclear buildings with a, a density of uh, iron bar in the cement that only if you see, you will understand what I'm talking about, to uh, size of superconducting magnets. You see one of the TF coils uh, uh, there to uh, the need of having all the operations remotely handled and so on and so forth, to uh, what I was talking about, the uh, tritium breeding modules that uh, have to be uh, designed from scratch and tested uh, from, uh, from scratch. So each of these components is per se something which is extremely complicated to do and it's on the edge of the technology. Then you take the complexity and you have to put it all together. And then you see, uh, you start seeing the scale of the challenge that, uh, um, that you have. And okay, there are a few numbers, you know, kilometers of pipes, uh, tens of kilometers of electrical cables and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And then of course there is, there is the supply chain because as I said, you need to integrate all the things that uh, are going to be uh, put together. And so uh, there are completely different types of actors that have to interact and work together in order to achieve uh, the uh, desired effect. Uh, this, is JT, this is not ITER, this is JT60. Which is, uh, which is the satellite tokamak that, uh, that we are building together with the, with the Japanese. And that initially was given as a compensation to Japan uh, for siting ITER in Europe. And nowadays, uh, when hopefully it finally starts working, it will be the largest tokamak in operation in, uh, in the world and does work, which is uh, scientific work, which is complementary to, to, to the one of ITER. Um, and when we go back to the complexity and the fragmentation, you see all the different all the different actors which are involved. We are talking about uh, we have some something like four thousand people on site, around two thousand people to the ITER team 
and uh, domestic agencies uh, plus contractors that that work there um, plus all the people plus all the people that work in each and every one of the of the countries so i will just show you a few pictures now um, just to show you the size of the of the pieces uh, that that are made and these are made with precisions um, with precision of uh, less than a millimeters and ways of uh, you know the, the big crane that uh, that moves objects in the assembly hall moves 1500 tons so these, these these are the numbers that we are talking about and we can continue with the cryogenic uh, with uh, uh, you know this is the uh, is the is the, and I like to call it the cryo plan, you know, for for the for the magnets, uh, the neutral beams, and, and so on. Is the biggest fridge that you have that you have in the world. By the way, it's being commissioned, so it is quite ahead. These are the uh, the smallest of the poloidal field coils that um, that are that are uh, that was done in China. Uh, and this is a piece of the cryostat that that is going to be put. So this, this is just to give you this is just to give you, you know these are helium tanks and so on. This lie this this is a small vehicle you know is what you use to uh, to move certain uh, certain pieces. Uh, so this is uh, this is the kind of stuff you know a specific road had to be built from the port of uh, fossil mer near marseille to 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 bring to bring the certain components that arrive by ship to uh, to the other side uh, as you as you may as you may imagine uh, what what is very important is that you know this is all for post 2050 but what is actually what is actually very important is that it has a big economic impact now because all this money, apart from going into uh, salaries of the people who work there, goes to uh, all the companies which are involved in doing and preparing these components. In some of the slides, you have seen also the name of quite a few Italian companies that are, that are involved. There is a large involvement of, um, of Italian industry in, in, in the construction of, of Italy. Italy, I think, is the uh, after France, uh, France received lots of money because of the buildings and, you know, let me say the local, uh, the local things and so on. By the way, France also pays directly 20% of the European budget of it. So Europe pays 80% and France pays the, uh, the remaining 20%. And then there are all uh, spin-offs, startups, joint ventures, which are created in order to redeploy technologies that are that are used that are used for it. For example, the cockpit of um, I think is the Fokker uh, 100 is being forged using explosive techniques which were used on the uh, on, on it. The, the production of uh, low temperature uh, semiconductor wire in the world had to be multiplied by 10 in order to supply the uh, amount of superconducting cables which are needed in order to produce the heater coils. So you understand that also all the manufacturing needs to be scaled up and match the, uh, the challenge. And what is, uh, how can I say, very difficult to imagine is uh, how this know-how this tooling and this technology which is needed to produce all these will actually be retained because if you produce it for it and the next machine of this size will come in 30 years all this will be lost uh, so this is this is a very important also issue that needs to be uh, that needs to be kept in mind um, i just want to say one final word because in the past few years, uh, there, are, um, there are a number of uh, private companies that have uh, started to say that they can do fusion. Um, there is a large population of these companies in the US, in the order of 35, 40, and there are two in Europe. And, um, uh, well, 
And uh, I think that this is an important, uh, uh, it's a very important development because it means that the private sector has decided that this is a technology on which you can bet and you can risk your money. Secondly, because it creates an ecosystem that uh, can break out of the, um, let me say, traditional public sector um, induced processes and uh, the possibility that you can have some disruptive technologies that come out of such an environment are, of course, very high. Um, unfortunately, I think that we are into the overpromise. I was uh, last month in Washington and there had a meeting with, uh, with some of the Americans. The Americans, uh, they tell you, ah, by 25, my device will be working. I said, be careful, by 25, I will not have retired yet. So I will come back and I will ask you uh, why you didn't achieve what you said. So uh, we, will have, we will have to see uh, whether this is reality or not. What is very important also is that uh, I, I pose them a question I asked, uh, is, uh, um, uh, are you upset that governments are giving so much money to Twitter and you know, they don't find us you instead? And he said, no, because uh, we need the institutional money in order to have uh, enough knowledge and enough human resources that can come and go from us to Twitter. And, and I found it quite, quite an interesting res response because indeed, uh, you know, my first instinct would have been immediately to say, don't give any money to these, uh, to these uh, um, uh, you know, uh, nationally funded uh, uh, science, give it to us because we private sector are much more agile. This is something similar that happened in the space industry. You know, these days in the space industry, uh, you have uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, you have others that, uh, you know, send, uh, have produced, uh, you know, launchers and so on and so forth. I have just one thing in the back of my mind, which is all this has come 50 years after we went to the moon. Uh, and here we didn't go to the moon yet. We, we, are still, we are still in a phase which is completely experimental and is not there. So is the time right? Well, uh, many of you will know about DTT much more than me, so I don't, I don't want to say anything about DTT. I just want to acknowledge that uh, I think it's very important in terms of uh, what I was calling environment, both in terms of science and technology. <laughs> industrial knowledge and so on, it's extremely important that uh, machines are built and the know-how is developed consistently. So I want to acknowledge the effort uh, that Italy has done on uh, and Frascati is doing on DTT. I think it's, it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a very important thing. And I will leave you with this quote um, about the moon. And I will thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions from the business? There is one. Thank you, Dan. Two students must have taken the answer to that question. Thank you for the presentation. There have been tons of uh, possible discussion. Uh, one question I have is uh, whether well, you think that uh, renewable are in competition for base load, for example, for the uh, point where we and new plants uh, yeah, together. Or, uh, you can really believe that uh, we 
Thank you very much for your question. Um, I don't think that the nuclear and renewables are in competition. I think that they are perfectly complementary technologies. And if you look at the scenarios that were published by, by us, by the commission in, uh, in 2018, uh, we did, I, I don't remember, seven or 10 different scenarios. Uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm old and my memory goes. But if you look at them, if you look at them, um, you can say comprehensively, you will see that roughly speaking, uh, the energy system of the EU is thought to be 85% renewables and 15% nuclear, grosso modo. So this nuclear is believed to, uh, to remain in the grid. Now, uh, there are people who advocate 100% renewables, which is, of course, uh, something, as I said, that will have to be demonstrated. It will probably be demonstrated if there are uh, storage technologies we can, which can work together with the renewables and whether the grid on its own can survive without, without baseload. But I don't think that there is a competition. Now, whether fusion, uh, you know, if I understand your question correctly, basically you are saying, will fusion come too late to be useful? Um, this is a very difficult question to answer. I'm not so sure that there will be anything which comes too early or too late, if you want my personal view. I think that um, you will need the cohabitation and cooperation of all the possible sources of energy in order to have an energy mix which is diversified and secure uh, for all the different types of uh, countries also that you have in the world. I mean, if you, if you, look, if you look at the situation, you, know, you mentioned wind. Well, wind is good if you have a large coast, like Italy does. If you speak to the Czechs or the Hungarians, they tell you we have no wind. Um, so this is why they look at the problem at the problem very differently. So I think that you will you will see uh, you will see developments which are which are in this direction. But I also hope personally that you will see disruptive developments which will shortcut uh, you know the linear path. Let me say. Thank you for the presentation. I just want to ask you um, about the way that people do not feel very safe. Thank you. As I said, this is uh, this is a very this is a very important question, and uh, you can operate and build um, nuclear installation only if you have the public trust. I don't think that you can do you can do otherwise. Uh, what is quite interesting is that uh, if you look at the um, fear curve that you have uh, for people living in the vicinity of a nuclear installation, it goes like that. So people who are near, they don't fear, or maybe I should paint it the other way. I don't know which way you want your graph. Um, people who live near, they don't fear. They benefit from it. They have jobs. They... Um, they know what is happening on the plant and so on. When you go to distances that are around 70, 100 kilometers, uh, people start to fear the, uh, the effect of the plant. Um, so 
this, uh, this I think I'm telling you this because I think this shows the uh, the psychology of, of 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 what there is. In terms of risk, I think that uh, there has to be uh, an, a, a, a clear decision, and this is a political decision, on what level of risk you may want to accept. Um, the new plants, and this is where also the discussion on the small modular reactors come in, the new type of plants are designed uh, in order not to have uh, evacuation in case of a major accident. Uh, of any population around the plant. Uh, so these are these are the these are the sort of uh, technological advances that may help the uh, the introduction of these uh, different technologies. I mean, you will have you will have the same type of questions. Nevertheless, uh, let me say you want to to build a large chemical plant. It's also a highly regulated activity uh, that needs to uh, fit uh, safety and security parameters like uh, like an industrial activity so i think uh, you know i don't think that there is a magic uh, recipe what i believe though is that um, the discussion on it should actually be much more knowledge based rather than policy based this, I think, is what is very important in, 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 in my exception at least. So I'm not sure that anymore. This is still a focus on the future. So just to briefly make a little bit of this, you are like very well that today several public stakeholders, public companies, public organizations are entering in the future. And in the last 40 years, we have done a very good which talk about something about using public funding. I know that the combination of the two factors will be the vision of the future. But according to you, we will take it. And please don't be so polite to me as well. Which is the best, uh, best option? So the best option is that the public funding will be disrupted. The, 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 sorry, the public funding will be disrupted for the things that we are doing. And the infusion will be easy to achieve through small and several. Company, or maybe we have to found more public organization because we're seeing we have spent or we are spending for the most important project one tenth of what has been spent to produce stadium in, uh, in Qatar. Right? One tenth, not so much, obviously. Or something more. At least a little bit. <laughs> okay, I'll try to be as impolite as I can. Um, however, I, I think I think that um, if you if I have to follow my instinct, my instinct is competition. When I um, in the late eighties I was working in Jet, as I mentioned, uh, there was a big competition between Jet, um, TFTR in the US, uh, JT sixty in Japan, and so on. If you concentrate all your resources in a single project, the spirit of competition naturally dies. So whether the competition is between public and private or whether it's between public and public, uh, I'm not so sure it's very important. But what I think is that uh, there has to be uh, collaboration on the one hand, but there has to be a level of healthy competition if you want to advance fast. And maybe, maybe this is one of the things that has been uh, missing uh, since the uh, decision to build ITER. Uh, if, I, if I have to be really impolite, you see, uh, and this is where, and this is where the um, a decision will also have to be made, whether, uh, let me say, in Europe or uh, in the US or uh, in other part of the, how can I say, the global Western world, uh, there will have to be a leap forward 
and uh, go faster than uh, other countries, which may become systemic competitors like China, instead of working only together with them. Should we keep working with them or should we go faster than them? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very close to the conclusion, so I would like to talk to Professor Victoria Redis, the Director of our Economics and Engineering Society Department, uh, our rector, Professor Bertini, Victoria. I have just a uh, uh, question for you, but it's just a comment or a suggestion. What do you think is the play, the, the role you can play from uh, university and uh, for the next uh, generation? Uh, not only fusion, but also uh, in the fields of research in energy. Because of, uh, we try to use and we convert our course from Italian to English in order to have an international course in engineering to let our foreign students come and understand. Just a comment from this. Well, thank you very much. I, I think I. Think I, I uh, at least hinted at this during the presentation when I said uh, when I said that uh, um, the average age of people working in this field I'm afraid is too high. Uh, so the um, the uh, the need of having a university which uh, produces talents, but across the field, you know, because as I try to show you, the technologies which are needed are uh, far and apart from, from each other, you know, from materials to, to uh, the deployment of semiconductors, to mechanical engineers, to neutronic engineers, and so on. So, I mean, you, you can go to the scientists that then have to use this, have to use these toys, you know, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a productive way. So it's not only engineers that, uh, that you need. I think that uh, this role cannot be uh, highlighted enough. And indeed, I think, you know, I, I, Sorry, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to be polite, but uh, but the reason why I've accepted to uh, to come here and and talk to you today is indeed that I was uh, fascinated of what you told me about uh, what you are trying to do here uh, in this university and to build this uh, this type of new competence. I was speaking to one of your students, a doctoral student earlier on. Uh, and he told me, I'm doing a doctorate in, in uh, fusion energy. And I said, and what do you do afterwards? You know? I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question because if you don't indeed create uh, the environment in which then this can, be, this can be applied, you will not get the people who, who will come here. So I think that your role is absolutely fundamental. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm sorry I was a bit late. I was in Rome for another meeting. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Gariba for, for uh, this lesson to everybody. Uh, and I think that this is very important for you students to have the opportunity to, to learn uh, what they are doing outside these uh, buildings. You know that we invested a lot in uh, energy, in our, uh, not only in engineering courses, but in many other courses of university. Our university has been funded on the idea of sustainability. Uh, and these, uh, these themes of sustainability, climate change, uh, sustainable energy are transversal to many uh, degrees in this, in this university, but in particular, in industrial engineering and mechanical engineering, we are in a great today. Uh, energy is a fundamental aspect. And we also try to make it more international. Uh, this year, thanks to the English version of mechanical engineering, we, we are welcoming many students from uh, all over the world. And this is very important. And we also invested a lot in future energy since uh, we met with the Secretary came here just a few years after me. And 
We invested a lot, we made many projects. Uh, we have several PhD students working on this topic. We have uh, several students that are working on their thesis on nuclear energy. Uh, I was really fascinated by, by this uh, steam. And also, uh, I started also to be involved uh, in these themes. And because I think that in this kind of uh, experiments they are carrying out uh, to Europe, uh, Italy, and then here in Italy, but many others that are uh, in all over the world. I think we have all the aspects of mechanical engineering and in the leading edge of mechanical because we have to solve uh, many problems uh, really challenging for, uh, for our. Uh, researchers for our students and I hope we will succeed. I hope to see the first uh, energy system based on fusion energy producing electricity, sustainable electricity with low environmental impact. So thank you very much for being with us and thank you to the students for, uh, for coming and attending the class and I'm Leave the floor to Tiziana for the last for the last three minutes. <laughs> Prego, Tiziana. Yes. <laughs> 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 